All right, comics are great. <laughs> the visual storytelling show. Uh, the 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 guys, the production guys, started us while we were all just chatting away like a bunch of old ladies. Oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yes, I'm Jersey Joe's cartoonist and teaching artist, and this show was recorded every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at the Ann Arbor District Library, which is right on the corner of 5th and Williams in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, you can participate live by going to comicsagreat.tv, where you can participate via chat, or you can just watch it after the fact uh, on comicsagreat.com and eventually uh, very soon at aadl.org. So uh, i got a couple guests with me today for this week's show. We've got the return of... Uh, I don't know if you're an arch enemy or if you're more of a well, rogue. Well, I'm kind of arch. <laughs> you're, you're more of a rogues gallery kind of uh, guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Paul's story has returned to the show, storyville.com. Always, always a pleasure, Jersey. Mm, it's always something. Yeah. <laughs> it's always good TV at any rate. Yeah. Uh, and we're close enough to actually hit each other this that's time. That's true. Yeah, I'm going to have to be careful, and so will you. Uh, <laughs> we know where each other lives anyway. You've been to my house. That, oh, I haven't been to yours, no, though. No, you haven't. Oh. And I specifically did not let them uh, Google Street View my house. Did so you, you really? Did it. you blur it? Yeah. No, no. It's it. The, my whole subdivision It was not done. Oh. Well, not we, we filed an injunction or something. I oh, I was going to say, I thought that was like a reflection of what kind of neighborhood you're in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> a jug with XXX on the front. <laughs> Nice. Uh, I, I couldn't resist. So anyway, uh, yes, Paul is back, and this is going to be a fun one, as usual. Uh, I'll, I'll, we also have uh, Mr. Krishna Sadasvam, the guy I've talked to online in a long time, at least not face-to-face -face on uh, the Skype. Krishna Sadasvam. Hey, guys. PCWeenies.com, UncubeTheComic.com, portfolio site. Where's your portfolio site? KrishnaDraws.com. Ah, there we go. So And PC Weenies on the Twitter. PC Weenies on the Twitter, uh, Krishna AIT, uh, if you're interested in his uh, role as a teacher. Because you teach. You're an you're art teacher. Yes. At the Art Institute of Tampa. Oh, Tampa. Yeah. Which means you're in Florida. Mm -hmm. You don't teach online. I, I'm so sorry. I why, why are you sorry? Because I hate you Florida. You guys do not like the weather right now. Did, have you not, did you not get that earlier that I don't like Florida? No. What oh, was that all about? Okay. I, I, it's... it's a strip mall built on a swamp. Oh. But the weather's beautiful. No. <laughs> and what is it, like 96, 90% humidity there? It's crazy humid. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like take Michigan in, in August yeah. and then, like, turn up the heat and turn down the, the breeze. Mm. And, uh, and make that six months out of the year. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and make it smell like, like sea bill food so oh wow but but tampa's, <laughs> <Very glamorous. laughs> but, but tampa's much nicer than than where my family lives in florida okay well we won't go any further than that okay <laughs> so you don't want their address <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna call you the google street view yeah. uh so krishna you you recently announced that you were taking some time off of the update schedule for pcweenies.com uh did you want to talk about that a little bit i mean what what prompted this uh I don't know. I just haven't given myself a break in 13 years of making web comics that I felt like I needed one. Um, I also feel that in today's publishing environment, I don't necessarily need to have a regular update schedule. It's not as important now as it was maybe you know five or ten years ago when uh, people were just trying to figure this out. So I, it, it makes it more productive for me. I can focus on other tasks. I'm using you know this time to kind of put together the second book. Uh, work on a couple of other personal projects that I've been needing to get to, and not just killing myself every week, week in and week out, making strips and not doing anything else. So it's been nice to take a little bit of a break. Oh, cool. Well, and you got a, a substantial library of... 13 years. Uh, yeah, yeah, 13 years. You, Yeah, I, I think that that's, you know, so if somebody stumbles across the site, it's not like they're going through two of them and then going, oh, where's the next one? Right. <laughs> And then, and then a Kickstarter campaign and follow me on Twitter. Huge buttons next yeah. to the two comics. Because <laughs> we all know Twitter is the way to promote yourself. Oh, yeah, Twitter and, and Kickstarter is the way to fund your project, even if you don't have any, uh, you know. An actual project. An actual <laughs> <laughs> Pay my rent. Uh, so, okay, let's, let's get people introduced to you because yeah, I know you, Krishna, and you know me. Uh, but uh, the general public at large, the, the Ann Arbor public and the uh, – Librarians who are listening who may want to order a copy of PC Weenies, why should they? What is it? 
Well, it's uh, 120 pages of uh, and, and two years of a lot of work uh, and, and personal toil, and I think um, it's it's a book that's really kind of geared towards uh, technology enthusiasts and uh, and techies in general. So it's kind of a comic that's not necessarily aimed uh, squarely at kids, but it's an all ages friendly comic. Uh, so you can read it and share it with your child. And if they happen to be very technologically savvy, or if they happen to like computer humor and geek culture and that type of thing, I think they would really appreciate and, uh, enjoy the book. We should say it's a comic strip and it features a family and it has a lot of the, uh, the kind of humor of, uh, dad only calling you when he needs tech support kind of things. Right. Yes. Uh, Misadventures with Bob Wiener uh, having to work at uh, oh what was the what was the Best Buy analog that you came up with I forget now bogus buy bogus buy that's right that's right and then having to uh, deal with customer service there when he knows better than what he's supposed to be pushing things like that so so tech humor anybody who who uh, follows uh, any of the, the Ars Technica websites or um, CNET will probably enjoy PC Weenies what would you say. Yeah, and it's also peppered with storylines too. So I mean, you know, I'm, I'm starting to explore the characters more, and they have their own personality quirks that lend themselves into different adventures and that type of thing. For example, in the first book, we fall uh, we follow the rise and fall of Bob as he loses his job basically by setting the IT building uh, or IT room on fire. So he gets canned from work, and he has to basically start at ground zero, being an unemployed engineer. An IT guy, and he winds up getting um, his quote-unquote dream job, but it turns out the dream job isn't really what everyone uh, what he expected. So um, he he ends up working at the world's largest search engine company that rhymes with Google, called Foodle, which is actually an 18th century word that means nonsense. And uh, he ends up working at this company where, on the surface, it seems like they're all put together well. And uh, in reality, he discovers that the whole place is in shambles. So um, it, it follows Bob's adventures, and it, it's it's not really about um, it's not just about Bob, but uh, you know, he is the he is the main chief pro protagonist patriarch. So he seems to be careful, enjoy the most. Well, okay, so. Now that we introduced you in uh, PC Weenies to people, uh, we should also talk about Uncubed, which is another book that people can get. They can get a uh, PDF ebook version, right? Uh, from well, I don't, I don't have a PDF yet of Uncubed, but I do have um, you know the PC Weenies sampler as a PDF file. I'm planning on actually working on uh, making an Uncubed book, a proper book, uh, once you know again once I have a little bit more time. Currently, that strip is also on a bit of a hiatus just because I've had just way too many projects to manage. Yeah. But uh, that comic focuses on the, um, you know, growing up as an Indian kid, kind of like being a first generation uh, Asian growing up in the United States. And it kind of follows, uh, it, it's largely autobiographical and follows kind of like the, the life and times of a guy named Krishna, um, me. I was going to say, uh, where did you come up with that name? <laughs> Actually, yeah, it was originally um, going to be Chuck Vindaloo. It addresses all those things. It addresses, you know, what it was like being an Indian kid growing up in, uh, you know, in the '70s and '80s, where I was really the only Indian kid in my entire school. Most people hadn't even seen an Indian kid besides watching things on television, documentaries about poor people and stuff. Um, so it's just fighting stereotypes and just kind of trying to be able to carve a niche and get an identity in a culture where I really didn't have any role models yeah. growing up. So. Um, that's a fun book, and I'm writing that book as uh, I'm writing this. It's actually in a strip format, but I'm writing it as uh, an autobiographical piece for my daughter, so that when she gets old enough to read, she'll have a little um, kind of a visual diary of sorts. Uh, you know, and it, it also chronicles what it was like for me, you know, being a new dad, that type of stuff too. So there is, you don't have to be Indian to like it, but if you're Indian, um, you kind of appreciate a little bit of the the undertones and stuff. So. Most of the readers of that strip are actually uh, people that are not Indian. But. Yeah. Uh, this is going to tie into something I want to talk with you guys about today as like a, as a general topic. But before we go any further, I, did, I was told to ask by some friends, uh, when is Chuck Vindaloo going to happen as a series? Oh, yes. <laughs> I've got the domain name, and I totally want to do that. Um, Chuck Vindaloo actually... Um, it's the name that I use when I go to restaurants. <laughs> because if I just tell the server that my name is Krishna, I get these weird looks 
where people are just like, okay, how do I spell that? Is it a C-H or is it a K? So I came up with this persona, Chuck. And Chuck is basically um, uh, a turbaned Indian guy that just happens to not take things sitting down. He's a really tough guy, but he also happens to be a softie at heart. He's kind of like Mark Rudolph if he was Indian. Ah, <laughs> ah there you go. That, there, there's, there's your elevator pitch for the publishers. <laughs> and they're like, Mark who? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He's, he's actually like 50 times more famous than anybody he's, in this He's room. really infamous? Yeah, like... infamous, yes. Like the infamous El Guapo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so famous, he's infamous. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, establish all that. Mr. Story, you have a poster behind you. I do. And we mentioned this last time you were here. We but, did. But we for did. those who are new to what you do, uh, you also brought some other books to show that you're I not, did. You're I not did. a sophist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can't claim that, but <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not just a sophist. Right. There we go. There we go. You have a little bit of evidence to the contrary, yes. but the, the jury's still out. So what, yeah. what else do you got here? Well, give us your credits. I, I actually decided to bring a few um, things that uh, I did at DC. This is actually... My very first um, DC published comic, uh, oh. which is uh, Batman, Batman Beyond. Beyond, with a cover by by the exceptional Darwin Cook, which oh, I just wow. I was like, wow. Yeah. Um, and I was an idiot because Darwin once offered me this cover, and I never followed up with him. Why? Because I, I, <laughs> I was. Uh, remember last time we were talking about the whole like, oh my God, you're so good. I can't. I can't talk to you. Yeah. I had a little bit of that. It was like I, you know. I don't deserve to have the cover. Oh, so. that's bad. You missed out. I did. I did. And then I had some uh, Justice League adventures. Fun. Um, and then my, here, see if I can. I got this my, one. The Gotham Girls. Yeah. Which uh, was based on a web strip. Um, hmm. So it's almost like you can appreciate this. Since there was a, <laughs> because I don't get excited about comics unless it's regular, digital. Yeah, unless it, was, it, unless it had some validation of, of, of being on the web. Pixels. Oh, actually, you want to want here's here's a, a place to go before we go in, uh, to the the big topic because I want to just throw this out there. Mm -hmm. I know I'm hitting you guys blindsided, and so I don't expect like a full answer from you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not expecting anything good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but, but uh, so J.K. Rowling, the whole thing that she did recently where she went digital. Uh, Potterheads. Yeah, Pottery but, Barn. Potter, Potter <laughs> Barn. Potter <laughs> Barn. I think they call it. Yeah. Was it really? It wasn't Potter. No, Barn. it's Potter Moore. Right Potter Moore. Yes. Uh, anyway, so she. I wish they'd do a little Potter less, mm -hmm. but you know. Hey. hey. A boom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just watching Larry Sanders the other day. Hey now, oh. that's the one that you got to do. Uh, but anyway, so she she goes digital, and more and more of these big authors are going digital, and they're going to make a lot more money off of selling the digital copies up through on their own without going through a publisher, right? And, sure. Okay. So. It made me wonder, are we going to see a reversal in the next maybe 15 years where the publishers is where the novices start and then self-publishing is like you're uh, not, now you're advancing to the pros? Because like the only way to make a lot of money off self-publishing is when you're big enough. And the only way to get big enough is to work with a publisher in the beginning. Um, I think you have to be J.K. Rowling big to, to really – cash in on the level that she and, will. And the only way to get J.K. Rowling big is to start out with a publisher who has the marketing clout right, savvy right. in order to make you that big, so right? I, I or think, assist in making you that I, big. I think you may see that um, on some level. I think that you'll you'll still see a lot of people who are like, oh, you know, that's a lot of other work. I like to just write. I mean, or or just, you know, there are people who would, they, they like having someone else to do the promotion to do that stuff. Now, J.K. Rowling certainly can hire, yeah, 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 that's what I'm saying. Hire her own stuff, but you know, it's it, J.K. Rowling is kind of a, a one in a thousand, probably closer to one in a million. So I don't know. I, I I think that you'll still see a lot of people going for the traditional publishing route. Although I think you may see a lot more traditional publishers um, going the digital route. 
<laughs> wow, what a non-committal answer. <laughs> I think you'll see a little bit of this and a little bit of that. No, I'm just teasing. But anyway, where, where, where I was going with I'm not talking. Uh, actually, I should just say you're wrong, Jersey. You're absolutely wrong. Because <laughs> that's what they expect. Of <laughs> that is what they expect. That's what the audience uh, is looking for. That, that's what they crave. Uh, because you're, you're, you're their avatar. <laughs> you're that's here to kick me in the groin in public. Uh, no, where I was going with this is not, not not about making J.K. Rowling money necessarily. Yeah. You know, it's like. Do, his, do we want Krishna's answer? Yeah, well, Krishna, go ahead. I have to no, remind him. Yeah, I, otherwise, I'm, Paul and I are just going to talk over you. I'm familiar with what Pottermore is. I, I think it's going to be a set of uh, you know additional stories that J.K. Rowling has produced. Is that what it is, or? It's going to be. She's still. She's selling digital versions of her books herself without going through any publisher. So it's all 100% of the proceeds goes into J.K. Rowling Incorporated or whatever. Does so. it really? <laughs> Except for that, uh, that, that special subcategory uh, company was just laundering money in the Cayman Islands. No, Island. no, I just wondered if there was, you know, if, if the publisher does have some sort of agreement where they'll, they'll get a little bit of return on on their initial investment. What, everything I read said new. No. Okay, well then, you've, you've obviously paid more attention to this than I have. Because Is it was there digital. Is there going to be any DRM on the books, or are the books just going to be PDF files, or exactly, you know, that, like... That I don't know. That I wasn't paying attention to, whether or not there was going to be, like, whether it was, I think it was going to be EPUB, but I'm not sure now. I, I think they're going to fire a laser into your eye, burning <laughs> it into your brain, so you cannot pass it on. I think they're actually going to say higgledy-piggledy and then wave a stick, and then it just shows up in your hands. Uh, yes. Or a, a digital owl will bring it to you on your desktop. Yeah. No, no, but what I was interested in is that it presents the opportunity to, like, okay, what, what are publishers, what's their value anymore, right? Okay, so, like, there's, uh, no, hold on, hold on, hear me out, Paul. I'm not, this isn't a publisher bashing seminar. Uh, but, like... Again. <laughs> As more and more people can deliver their content digitally, instantly, and like there's all these self-published authors who never went to a publisher and are selling, making $100,000 a month selling their books. I forget a the month? name. A month? Yeah, yeah. I forget the name of the author. There's this girl who's like this big breakout hit. She's in her 20s. She's selling 100,000 copies of her ebook for 10 bucks a month. She's getting, uh, oh, maybe it's more like 70 because I think she's selling them through Amazon. And so I think it's a 70-30 split, but still that's an amazing amount of money to be making. And that's not... Oh, sorry, I'm hitting my microphone because I'm too excited. We're both smacking I know we're both doing Kermit the Frog arms right now. <laughs> but, but it's not, the, the money, like the, the gobs of money part is, is fascinating, but that's not the interesting thing to me necessarily. Like, I just want to make a livable wage, and here's somebody who's showing that, okay, you can. Yeah. Um, so does that suggest that the, uh, but th there's only so many breakout hits, and so uh, all, there's now all these uh, traditional published authors who are moving to ebooks, Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, and they're self-publishing because they, they realize I don't need the publisher anymore. Uh, but so will that mean that the publishers can find new relevance by saying, well, we're the place where we'll nurture the authors and make them into stars so then they can go off and graduate to self-publishing? Because right now in book publishing, if I say, oh, I self-publish, people are like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they have a cure. Oh, here's somebody's posting a link in the chat. Uh, she, uh, I think that stigma is starting to go down now go down now. I mean, in terms of saying I'm self-published, I think that's carrying a little bit more respect now because the quality that's coming up, particularly the area of digital comics, is is pretty impressive. I, and uh, I think that, don't you think that uh, in comics we've, uh, for at least like the last 20 years, we've had less stigma as, as far as that goes? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I mean, you know, it, it, I'm not talking about stigma with regards to the medium itself, but I'm talking about the stigma of actually, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, the idea of comics, um, the, the independent comic not being of good quality. I think that might have been somewhat of a case back in the 80s, but we're seeing a lot of very talented, very hardworking individuals that are producing what I would consider to be very professional quality work, like, you know, Mike Mayhack or uh, Eddie Pittman. Those guys, there's, there's like several examples of stellar digital comic content that's coming up. And, uh, you know, I think people are rising to that. And plus, you know, we're going now with, with tablets that are coming out. I think that it's a medium that's kind of like uh, a perfect opportunity for people to start looking at reading stuff digitally. Mm hmm. Well, okay. I just wanted to throw Did that I out there. Did I ask that question completely? Or I mean, no, no. I mean, I think, I think we just. I, 
to a question like that, the only answer you can say is interesting, right? I mean, like, there's really no... Unless... Well, that's better than you usually get. <laughs> yeah, actually, yes. Uh, usually get... Uh, oh, uh -huh. But uh, but anyway, I did want to throw in uh, Renee Van Belson in the chat here just threw out uh, that uh, J.K. Rowling is offering her books DRM-free. He posted a link. I'll put it in the show notes for the show. Yeah, so. That's interesting considering how kind of litigious things have been about Harry Potter up to now. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's kind of... Okay, so what, what, I, here's another sub-question. What's your stance on PDFs? Do you think that you should put DRM on them, or do you release them DRM-free? I'm releasing mine DRM-free, and... How come? I, um, just because I don't want it to be, you know, the whole idea with digital content for me is I want it to be accessible. If someone happens to pirate it, they happen to pirate it, I'm just hoping that the person who reads the content will find it enjoyable enough to come back and at least, you know, read the comics on the website or maybe actually buy a print book. Uh, for some people, and I understand sometimes piracy is required as kind of, you know, building a groundswell uh, for, you know, your audience. I mean, piracy doesn't necessarily, it might hurt somebody monetarily for a little bit, but I think it also is a good way of getting exposure. Not that I'm advocating anyone to pirate my book, but <laughs> I, I'm saying that, I, I'm just looking at it from a practical standpoint. I mean, we're giving away comics for free when we're publishing online. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the stuff that I've put together, I mean, not Rebootus Maximus, my, my trade, but the actual sampler, those are all the comics that you could read for free. What I've done with the sampler is that I've actually put everything in, in proper sequence to make the reading, you know, reading storylines a little bit easier to follow than the piecemeal format that you're getting by reading it on the website. So um, I don't know. I think putting DRM is just going to turn some people off to it, and uh, it's just going to. I have to worry about compatibility, support. I'd rather not do, deal with that because it's just going to bring up my costs. So DRM free is is the way I choose to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, what what is a PDF and a <laughs> and drum? What are what are these things? Okay. I so I, I take the chisel and, and put it into the, the rock. Yes, you should have seen Paul when he first saw the Skype screen sitting next to him. He was touching it and touching it. He's like, How how do you make this light bright move like this? Uh, <laughs> and they start biting the corner. Yeah. Uh, I'm just a humble, unfrozen caveman comic book. Writer. No, you gotta have. You don't have any of your work digitized yet. Um, most of my work is is not uh, is not entirely creator owned. Oh, um, yeah. so a lot of my work is digitized, but not uh, but by my publishers rather than by me. Okay. So, so well, then, okay, let's let's get. Go ahead, finish that. Oh, I was gonna say. However, I think that uh, Christian brings up a good point. Is that while he does not advocate piracy, he is choosing to release it in a form that. If if piracy, piracy happens, you're you're taking that as kind of a, a unpleasant cost of doing business, right? Whereas, um, and I think that's that's he's he's making the choice. The copyright holder is making the choice, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. What I don't appreciate is the people who, like for example, on a Wednesday or now on a Tuesday, scan a comic and put it up on the web, mm -hmm. because that's not the copyright choice holder making the choice. And I think that as long as the copyright holder is making the choice, you can't, you, there is no wrong choice. Mm -hmm. That's that's my own thing. I, I, I think... That's a, nice, that's a nice elegant way to put it. Yeah. It's surprising, huh? Yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, that, that would have taken me probably about four or five more sentences. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, w I was actually going to do four or five more sentences, but you cut me off. No, but can you do it as Shatner? <laughs> no, I'm, we'll I'm <laughs> pretty sure that I can. <laughs> we'll save the Shatner impersonations to the end. But, um... Okay, well, I, yeah, it's, 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 the, this whole idea of uh, piracy actually gets more complicated than uh, I originally thought. Because, uh, like, I, I always had it simplified in my head to, well, gee, I don't steal anything. And if I don't, probably a lot more people don't either. So let's, let, I'm going to walk into this assuming that most people aren't going to steal. But, but there are billions of people on there this are billions planet. Of people so, on like, 1% stealing is still a lot of people. No, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I am special. No, uh, no but, you're not. <laughs> Oh, I was good. Well, there's lots of ways to stay special. But anyway, uh, <laughs> where I was going with this is, is that 
there's also people who will take your stuff and strip off the attribution and repackage it as their own thing, which I didn't think happened as much as it does. But what's been going on in the t-shirt industry lately is oh. crazy. Yeah. That, that blows my mind that so many people do this. Like every week I'm hearing about another artist who's had their work stolen. And, I mean, and, and, you know, not uh, you don't have to be very famous right. to have this done to you. Well, that's it's kind of like the this guy uh, Rob Granito who got a lot of attention in in the comics and comic con uh, uh, field lately because he was basically taking images from comics or pictures and uh, then he would paint them. Like, he'd trace them and then paint, slap paint on them and present them at his work. And he had this whole, like, manufactured um, uh, resume. Like, oh, I worked on this and, oh, I worked on that. Oh, you're kidding me. And, uh, yeah, it was, oh, to the point where he, he said something about, uh, after Dwayne McDuffie's death, he said something about working with Dwayne McDuffie. Ooh. And uh, Mark Wade almost took his yeah. head off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, the thing was, uh, the, in particular that I'm thinking of, he... he um, did this with a painting of uh, a lady uh, who goes by Acid Pop Tart. Okay. Um, and he 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 took a, a photo of her as, as this particular character that she does, and and painted it. And it, I mean, his he's detached from reality to begin with from his replies to people complaining. Mm -hmm. But he was like, well, it was you know the picture was on the internet. That was sort of his, yeah, his justification. I've, well, the picture was on the internet. It must be okay to copy. I've heard that from from a handful of people in my lifetime, and every time I go, <gasps> when they say that, like, well, if it's on the internet, it's public domain, right? And I'm like, wow, really? It's like, it's 2009. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't say that? You know? If it was on the newsstand, I can just take <laughs> one, right? It was uh, right there. But, but it's unbelievable. But you know, the internet is also a great self policing mechanism, too, because someone like Rob Granito might have been able to get away with some of the stuff if it weren't for the internet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the in, in the sense that he could have peddled his wares and, you know, someone could have been naive enough to know, uh, to not know that he was not the author or the artist behind the works. But nowadays, it's like with the internet, people taking pictures at conventions and. And, and everything, it's like people will jump down this person's throat and literally, uh, you know, raise a stink. So, so the uh, internet is like those meddling kids and their dog. Yes, it is. Oh, yeah. I, I, I was going to go with the whole wagging the finger, shame, shame kind oh. of mechanism. Like, oh, shame on you. you and, and I went for Scooby Doo. <laughs> But but yeah, I mean, well, at least it's like a great first policing mechanism because if somebody's uh, stubborn or obstreperous about it and like, hey, Ooh, so much, obstreperous. hey how you like that? Yeah. Uh, how, they're going to say, I, try and stop me. I'm going to sell this T-shirt with your artwork on it, whether you like it or not. You know, then you got to take legal action if you want to protect your work. Uh, but uh, but at least at the very at the outset, you can you know say, hey, this guy did something bad, and then people all turn on him. Hey, hey you're a jerk, right? And yeah. that will. Often well, how, how do you feel about artists drawing licensed characters and selling those licensed characters at shows or doing commission works featuring, like, you know, Spider-Man or whatever? I mean, isn't that a little bit... I'm not saying that's the same thing as a Rob Granito thing, please, but, it, it, you know, there is some type of copyright that's being exercised there, and I guess both, you know, Marvel and DC kind of look away when mm -hmm. artists go ahead and draw Spider-Man and make money off of that. I, I sometimes wonder if they're they're kind of justifying it to themselves as it's it's fair use and then it is still promotional for them. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you know, and and they seem less worried about sketches than they do about say prints or you know that kind of thing. It's sort of as long as you don't go into their territory of uh, you know the the sorts of things you know you can't do a comic book of them you can't do a poster of them mm -hmm. but I, I think I don't know that this is their actual justification but mm -hmm. I, it, I I can almost see them saying well it promotes us so it falls sort of into fair use I did see uh, a former publisher of DC go ballistic on on somebody for um, basically he had collected. Um, a bunch of Im uh, images, uh, convention sketches that he had done, and he put them together and was selling them, you know, kind of as a portfolio at the con. And uh, he's like, "No, one, one is o acceptable. Like doing a print, you know, printing them is unacceptable." Yeah. But I thought that was weird because then you also see the people who are working for them 
doing sketchbooks and portfolios and things like that, sometimes featuring those well, characters. Well, yeah, that was one of the things I was going to bring up is that, yeah, as a guy who has done sketches of other people's characters and even sold the originals online, uh, I just, I'm very careful, or I try to be very careful to not insinuate that I have worked for these on these properties, right? If I'm gonna do a Spider-Man drawing and sell it, I'm not gonna say like, oh, I'm a Spider-Man artist. I don't try to insinuate that there's a relationship between me and Marvel that isn't there, right? And 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 what's more is I don't make prints, I only sell the originals, so there's only that one piece. That, so the, the, the technicality is they're buying my art, right? Rather than the character. Right, rather than the character. And if I made prints, then yeah, that gets into a, a ethically really ugly place. But it's interesting, to, this, this also came, there's been like a lot of, um, a lot of talking on the internets about uh, the internet. Yeah, yeah, and I'm talking like our former beloved president uh, the, the, about the Homestuck, Homestuck, the comic, and like uh, there's like a, this huge. Fa- See, this is this is a perfect model to. I didn't expect to go here, guys. By the way, but I think this is fascinating. But, so we'll but just, he's gonna anyway. Well, well, you guys, you guys took it there. You took it to this whole like, topic, yeah, yep. uh, you know, creators' rights and copyright and lefts and yeah, well, copy left and all that yeah. stuff. But. Uh, Okay, so there's this comic Homestuck. It's it's become a phenomenon online. Lots and lots of people like it, and people are all doing fan art for it. And some people are selling the fan art. And finally, the uh, after reaching like a critical mass of audience, the the actual creator of this of the um, the comic. Well, comic is a weird word. It, you have to check out Homestuck later, Paul, because it's like it's truly like internet comic, mm-hmm. where it's not just like internet comic. Where see, this is what happened like in the '90s, like when the internet comic started. It's like somebody started putting animated uh, gifs in them. Yeah, and it's like, oh, okay, you can do a new thing and you play. Homestuck took it to the next level and actually started making storytelling that is sort of dependent on being in a, in a internet environment. Yet it's still technically a comic. It's really interesting. I, I, I want to talk more about it on the show with uh, some people who are big fans, but who can talk your ear off about it. But anyway, um, so the creator got involved and said, like, uh, hey, you know, people selling this this uh, this fan art of my comic, oh, I, I don't want to misrepresent him. He had a very polite and very clear-headed way of, uh, I'm hoping the chat client can help me out here. He had a very polite and clear way of expressing some of the uh, ethically murky areas people were getting into, uh, you know, uh, I think it was that he wanted people to ask permission before selling fan. Mm. I think that's what it was. Um, and then, and then there was a backlash of people saying like, well, Hey, you know, we're your, uh, mixtape deli- distributors. We helped make your thing popular by doing fan art for you. We've been promoting you. Don't be a jerk. And then there's a lot of, ba- and this happens around and around and around with every time this comes around. Uh, so, Gosh, I don't know how I feel about this because I love seeing fan art of my comic characters, and that is promotion. That it's a flattering to me that somebody thinks about my character so much they want to draw them. But if, if somebody's selling like that, I mean, I, I do a lot of fan art too. I mean, I enjoy drawing other people's characters, and you know, usually it's just a tribute to the artists themselves. Uh, but I, I would feel uh, really, really odd if I uh, then turned around and sold, say, a fan art piece that I drew for someone else and and got money for it. I don't know. Um, now, if I'm doing something like if I'm making a print for myself to hang up in my office or whatever, then uh, you know, I think that's okay because I'm just doing it because I want to have my you know my fan art kind of you know in my office. But if I'm trying to make money off of it, I think that's where I would kind of I think there's a gray area there. Or actually, I wouldn't even do it. I think I think it's also interesting that um, especially if he basically said you know. Clear it with me. Yeah. Like that is such a reasonable request. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so that you know that you know you're not doing people aren't doing uh, uh, you know uh, sexually explicit versions or mm-hmm. which happens. Yeah. You you get people coming up to artists at conventions and going, "Can you draw me uh, the Invisible Woman but naked?" <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> well, then she's just a blonde lady. I mean, yeah. how do you know she's the invisible? You know, it, yeah. I, it's like there's weird stuff. Like, well, it's weird anyway, but it yeah. gets really strange when it's like the guy who asks for female characters and glue involved, and yeah, yeah and so he says, but it's not glue. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. wow, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or you know, oh, could you draw this person tied up? Yeah, it's yeah, like, that kind um, of weird. Yeah, okay, but we've got, yeah. <laughs> we've established that the internet is a scary place. That's well, and, and, <laughs> and conventions. So, and conventions. <laughs> Um, and apparently here too, because we know all, about all this stuff. So. But I mean, th- th- such a reasonable request. Yes. To clear it with me first. Yeah. That's not even you know the the fact that people get this sense of entitlement. Oh, we're your fans. We pay you, your 
um, you know, we pay your your bills, we do this stuff. And and there's a loss of the perspective that it's an exchange. Mm-hmm. I provide you entertainment, you provide me with a living for that entertainment. It's not, you know, it's not a, like, oh, we've given you so much. It's like only money counts. <laughs> it's like a, we gave you money, you just gave us uh, entertainment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, if we, we, out of the kindness of our hearts, we yes. have, we've given you money for the entertainment that we you didn't did. have to do it. We could have just pirated it. You know, that was in the Simpsons episode, right? When the Itchy and Scratchy and Poochie show, and then uh, the comic book guy was all mad at the show, and he's like, he's saying he's boycotting it, and because uh, they owed him better. And B- Bart Simpson says they've given you uh, thousands of hours of entertainment for free. What could they possibly owe you? You know, and he says, <laughs> as a loyal fan, they owe me. You know, yeah. But, you know, at the same time, though, I mean, you know, when you're first starting out and you're hungry for an audience and somebody says, I love this thing, I'm going to stand by it, I'm going to do fan art for it, that is a powerful thing, right? No, no matter what Jersey says, I do not condone eating your audience. What did I say? Oh, hungry for an audience. <laughs> well, should the zombie apocalypse happen or, no, you know, no. or society fall apart and it becomes like, uh, you know. Or you're just hungry. Or you're just <laughs> Actually, no, cannibalism is bad, everybody. Okay, for yeah, those of you... <laughs> Who thought that this is a gray area we just stepped into? Yes. No, it's. <laughs> I don't think Krishna, you don't condone cannibalism, right? I don't. Okay, okay. good, good to know. <laughs> all so, three of us on the same page here. Yeah, we actually all agree on yeah. something. That's great. Cannibalism, bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, That's what was for today? <laughs> yeah. So, what was the question again? Now I don't remember. Oh, oh, when when you're you know you're just starting out, you're you're you, you want an audience, you want people to stand behind what you're doing. Christian, you were there 13 years ago. I granted it was 13 years ago, and then you get that audience. I mean, you got to have some kind of sense of gratitude for it. And you, there is um, this comes into this whole 21st century thing. Like like some somebody posted in the chat, fan fiction. Uh, contributing to the fandom helps build momentum behind your thing, right? And so you got to be a little bit relaxed about it. Or do you? <laughs> I, and, and I think you have to trust your readership. I mean, really, that comes across, you know, that, that's even more important than, than ever before. If I'm going to be, you know, putting DRM on my books and things like that, I'm automatically making a, an inference that that person uh, is someone that I can't trust. And I'd rather, you know, I'd rather give people the benefit of the doubt. Now, yes, is, is someone going to go ahead and pirate it? Maybe they do, but... I'd like to think that the majority of my readers are actually pretty cool people and they'll do the right thing. And they're reading these comics for free anyway, so by buying a digital book, it's it's just kind of um, maybe kind of like a, hey, here's a, here's a tip or here's here's some uh, remuneration for your work or something like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Do you, now, do you um, do you do like ad revenues or something on your on your site? I I, I do have ad revenues. I've got uh, you know Google AdSense and I've got Project Wonderful ads. So so you know they are they are still kind of they're more or less paying for it the same way that broadcast television by watching right. stuff. Your it's ads largely you know ad sponsors. I've got you know companies that uh, you know are advertising on the site. So that does help offset things a bit. Yeah. I, I like when when it comes to fanfic, it's it's a that is definitely a gray area. Especially, you know, it was one thing when people were just kind of handing it around, like at a convention or something. Somebody would, yeah. Hand it, but yeah. since everybody can publish it on the web, yeah, and it can go out to you know theoretically millions of people, it it makes it a little. I, I can understand where some people would be a little more cautious about it. Um, again, when, you know, uh, when you, you, especially like, for example, uh, Harry Potter, uh, children's book, or, or, you know, at least young adult book. Okay. People are doing exp- sexually explicit fanfic. Right. And I could see how J.K. Rowling's would be like, ooh, I don't really approve of that. I would rather you didn't do that. And I just think that, uh, you know, maybe it's something that somebody should take the author's or, or uh, artist's or whatever um, opinion into, into account. Um, you know, I don't think that just by doing uh, entertainment or art, you owe the audience specific things. You, to what you owe the audience is to do your best. Mm-hmm. providing them with the content that, that you're doing. Mm-hmm. And 
if if a creator says please don't do this and you think oh well you know i made this person blah 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 it's like well wait supposedly you appreciate this person's work so why not respect their wishes or at least you know respect them their wishes enough to like keep it very much on the qt <laughs> you know i mean I'm like <laughs> well yeah i guess i uh... The only thing I can see as being a real big issue with that is that if, if uh, it's like it's like protecting a trademark, you don't want your trademark to be confused with anything else, right? Right. And so if somebody's making dirty Harry Potter stories, th the fact that it exists could be construed by some people as like, well, she must think be okay with this. Uh, but most smart people, most intelligent people are going to look at that and go, J.K. Rowling didn't do this. You know, she wouldn't approve of this. This is just some weirdo who has some weird ideas about Harry Potter. Right? That I really like to read. <laughs> you know. And for some reason, I can't put it down. <laughs> but I mean, don't you think that, like, again, going back to something Krishna talked about earlier, the self-policing mechanism, most people are smart enough to know when something, I mean, look at what happened. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with the whole, like, um, fanfic in Japan, how, like, it's like an entire industry, and they have stores where you can buy fanfic. That's kind of strange <laughs> well they're nuts anyway <laughs> no I, I, I just i find that kind of strange well i, I mean it, yet it, it, manga is more widely read there than than comics are here it seems to be a healthy industry so there's an example that i, mean, I need to bring in some people who are more familiar with uh because i was gonna say I, I i was under the impression that the manga industry was was shrinking a bit even if they shrink like two percent, they're still hundreds of times bigger than in you know. Well, yeah, the United but States. what if they shrink twenty five percent? Oh, they're not gonna. That's not. I don't see. Well, that I, I just I've heard that you know they're they're having their own difficulties that the audience is kind of kind of shrinking. So really, is it because I, they're playing video games? I bet you that's what it is. Either, video games either that or comics. because you know there's tons of fanfic on the on the web, or, <laughs> or people are are doing. Bit torrents. See, of I comics. choose I choose the irrational fear of video games. I just I had <laughs> the I had, rational fear of video games. <laughs> I, I had a conversation with somebody the other day who actually said, you know, like, well, are you are you worried that video games are killing comics? I'm like, oh, here we go, not this one again. You know, it's like I heard that rock and roll music makes children violent. <laughs> and doesn't that just make you want to punch them? <laughs> But they need a good spank and some good you know, corporal punishment. I just, uh, I just, you know, I want to. Turn on some, you know, some ACDCs or some Blue Oyster Cult and just pound the crap out of them. <laughs> but anyway. Please uh, save us, Christian. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're spiraling. Yeah. There's smoke coming out of the back. Uh, anyway, I don't, I don't know where, the, where there was any place else to go with that. I mean, uh, fanfic. And, oh, fanfic. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I guess for you, Paul, you keep coming back to this, this author's permission, author respect the author's intent. I, uh, yeah. To me, that's that's that is kind of the touchstone is if you if you appreciate the creator then you should respect the creator's opinion <laughs> sorry I, I, i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> if you if you appreciate the creator, it just I, I picture people saying nice things about you on Sundays. No, to, to no, no, to, no to one says nice. Eddie Izzard. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead, Krishna. The fan thing it boils down to this: either you respect the creator and their work, or you don't. Okay. <laughs> See, I mean, he said it much you, better than I did. You know, so if you don't respect the creator's work, I mean, obviously you're doing it for some other motive. Either you're trying to bring that person down, or you're trying to steal sales, or somehow smear the work or, you know, something along those lines, or you're doing it as a genuine tribute. And I think, um, I think people, and I'll give people enough credit for this, they'll know, you know, what's what when they actually see it. Well, there, there are, there are great parts of this too, though. I mean, there's, there's different kinds of appreciation as I know guys who, you know, give you a handshake when they see you, or they say, Oh, hey, you mother blanker. How the blankety blank are you doing? And they punch me in the arm really hard. And that's to show genuine affection, right? Whereas a guy like me goes, ow, after that. And why are you using those bad words? So, you know, there, there can be some. To, this is an analogy for somebody who could show appreciation for you in a very... So you want me to stop hitting you? <laughs> stop, stop punching me and <laughs> cursing like a sailor. You filthy man. But <laughs> no, but anyway, but... Um, yeah, I guess, I guess, uh, so does this mean that as authors, as creators of content, we need to be explicit about how we want our stuff used? 
And, and if, if this is a concern for you, you need to be very it straightforward. It depends on how you're licensing it. If you've got copyrights, then yes, that is a valid concern. But if it's a Creative Commons thing, you're basically saying, hey, as long as you attribute the original source back to me, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so you have to find out what the author has in mind. I mean, I know a lot of web cartoonists that have Creative Commons in their work. They don't mind you remixing or reappropriating their work. Uh, and you know maybe even coming up with um, I don't know additional dialogue or whatever you could you could just change it up however you want as long as you cite original attribution. Um, it just boils down to what the creator expects. So that, that, is that the cultural thing that we need to start being a lot more explicit about? Um, maybe even start a campaign like is reading is fundamental. You know back in the eighties, uh, but like attribution is a good thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and Krishna hits it right on the head though. It's creator you know the creator can do creative commons and that's pretty clear as what what you can do with it yeah yeah and again that's the creator's choice i cannot i cannot emphasize that enough why if if you like what the creator's doing respect the creator's wishes mm -hmm. and although you now that you're you've said that about the Sunday and whatnot. Now I'm, I'm like, <laughs> respect the creator. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking, I, I'm not trying to put comic book people on the level of, you oh, know. Oh, you can, you can. I won't argue with that. Yes. I know you won't. You have an over inflammation. There, there's a third edge to this too, where uh -oh. somebody comes in with the idea of like, say for example, uh, not necessarily fan fiction, but with regards to uh, not buying something, uh, that's available or reading something off of a torrent or whatever. They might respect the creator's work, but I hear this a lot, particularly from people that are in the college demographic. It's like, oh, well, I, I'm just broke. I'm poor. I can't afford it. So this is, this is the only way. I love the author's work, but I just can't afford it. Um, so you don't I'm buy making, that, Paul? I'm not making a judgment call on that. It is what it is, but at, at the same point in time, there's a lot of things that I can't afford, but I just can't walk into uh, a Nordstrom's or something like that and just grab something and walk out. <laughs> right. And then you turn to the cashier like, I'm poor. I'm poor. <laughs> I, I, I need this plasma TV. And then, and I'm, yeah. and then it's like a Mentos commercial. It's going, ah. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, that's, I, I think that really is what it, you know, the idea when I was in college and was poor and could not afford all the comics and there weren't torrents, the way it worked for me is if I could borrow it from a friend, which is one tangible thing while I was reading it, the friend couldn't. Um, otherwise, I just had to go without. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, there's this weird idea that because it's out there, I'm entitled to it. Right. And, and that's not the case. If, like, like you said, Krishna, it's when, when you can't afford something, you don't get it. It's yeah. just kind of... I know it's old fashioned. Uh, you guys are a couple of capitalists and I'm telling you the revolution is coming and it's called the internet and everything's going to be free and we're all gonna be dumpster diving for our food. It's gonna be great. <laughs> you sell it so well, Jersey. Yeah. yeah. You know, Jersey, I can't afford That's glasses. <laughs> so just give me those. Oh, okay. live and let live, man. Here, just yeah. share, share, share. Yeah. But, <laughs> I don't know that your prescription would be right for me, but I'm just taking them. If, if, if we had a better special effects budget, I would just uh, turn us into Jack Webb and Harry Morgan right now. Oh, that'd be <laughs> There'd be a guy with a hookah pipe sitting over there. And we'd Look, just be sit <laughs> Look, hippie. <laughs> Don't step on my rights, man. Uh, okay, well, you know, I think I think we, we got around this thing a little bit. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys about writing stuff today. I'm going to have to get you back to talk sure. about that. Because um, we're coming up on the end, I want to open this up uh, just real quick for questions in the chat. Um, oh, hey, Jono, demophon.tumblr.com in the chat said uh, a really brilliant thing that I should have thought of. Uh, if you can't afford something, one can ask their library to get it for them. <laughs> oh, <there you> go. <laughs> we have these great Excellent. institutions called public libraries where they, they, you know your tax money pays to get stuff for you. Yeah. So I, thank you, Jono. I did not think of that. Which, which is ironic yes. considering where we are. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, I'm sitting in a library. That was, that was not just ironic, it was kind of thoughtless. Uh, anyway, so um, speaking of- I was giving you the benefit of the day. Speaking of Creative Commons and, uh, and, and fanfic and remixing and, and users getting to actually play with content that's created by somebody, 
Uh, comics are great is a Creative Commons show, uh, show. So the videos that are on YouTube now at, at youtube.com slash comics are great. You can actually remix them. They have that new little remixing thing on there. And here's my pl here's my plea to the listeners out there is I want to hear an auto-tune song with Paul's story talking about comics. So make it happen, people. Please download the show or take clips of the show and put it into an auto-tune. Um, what, what, what song would you recommend? Ah, uh, boy, I've, I've, something by Katy Perry. <laughs> Blue Oyster Cult? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Katy Perry doing Blue Oyster Cult. <laughs> Don't Fear the Reaper. Uh, was that Blue Oyster Cult? Yeah, that yeah, was. Okay, yeah, but with, with Paul talking about comics, that's what yeah. we get to see. So, okay, well, um, I'm, we're going to do a little bit of shifting here in a second. Uh, we're going to move people around in the studio because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get uh, our AADL guest in here, and that means Paul gets ejected. I did not know we had an AADL guest. Yeah, yeah, we're going to start doing this every week. And so I, I, yeah. I should have told you. I yeah, should have told yeah. you. Yeah. That's uh, all right. <laughs> I, I'm good with it. <laughs> no, but, but stick around, because I, I, I do want to talk to you after, after we're done recording. Paul. Sure. But anyway, so this will be our chance to give everybody a, a round of applause and a plug for showing up and all the great discussion and ideas, all the great anger and ire and uh, frustration that we all shared. Uh, Krishna. Yes. Where, where, where should people go today to uh, find out more about you or to learn something interesting that you are doing? They can check out my work at PCWinnies.com. I just wanted to grab a copy of my book. Oh, yeah. Let's see it since we got video. Ta-da! Rebootus Maximus. Perfect for your library. <laughs> or your pleasure. Your personal library, or your school yes. library, or your university library. Do, do university libraries have comics? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do. They should. And in fact, uh, although I feel a little awkward mentioning it, uh, the Michigan State uh, library has an immense uh, comics collection. It's not a borrowing collection, though. You have right? to you have to read it there, but yeah. you can look at. It's just an amazing. It's one of those things where I'm looking up stuff online, and it's like, oh, if I wanted to read this, I could go to Michigan State and do that. Yeah. But it but it's an astonishing collection. It's a great collection. I got stuff in there too. Do How you? about that? I don't know if I am. <laughs> I'll have to check. Even self published slobs like me are in the collection there. So. I did not say that. <laughs> you sneer at my at my. Oh, oh so. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, yeah, you do. Uh, so uh, Krishna, piece, uh, reboot is Maximus, and then. No, it's volume one. Uh, volume two is currently being worked on, and I hope to have um, digital and print books available. Uh, probably print books will happen after the digital books uh, take place, which is kind of a backwards way of doing it. But I actually plan on making the print book have uh, even more additional content that won't be available in the digital version. Incentive. Clever. So, yes. So, okay, PCWeenies.com is the place to go. And uh, on the Twitter, you're PC Weenies. Yep. And uh, do you have a Facebook page you want to po point people at? Uh, you can no. find me on Facebook. I'm on there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't really use Facebook too much. I usually use it to share resources. So if anyone's interested in uh, interesting links pertaining to animation or comics or you know anything design related, I usually try to use my Facebook page for that. Cool. Mm. Well, thank you, Christian. It was good. It was good seeing you again. Yeah, it's been good a while. Talking to you, man. Thanks for having me, guys. We'll Lots do it again. We'll do it again. So, uh, Mr. Story. Yes. Where, where where's your stuff? Uh, you can find my website at storyville.com, S-T-O-R-R-I-E-V-I-L-L-E. -E. Um, I'm also Storyville on the Twitters, mm -hmm. um, or as Craig Ferguson, aforementioned Craig Ferguson likes to say, the Tweety Box. <laughs> um, and also, I, I, I know it's kind of, um, I'm, I'm going to migrate my website to a WordPress, but I still have a blog at Quest. The number four success dot live journal dot com. Oh, okay. I thought, I thought you were going to give me like tilde backslash. Yeah, no, not, not quite that bad. But it's, you know, people are like live journal, really? You're on live journal. Like, There's still a pretty vibrant community on I live journal. I would say journal. so. Yeah. I'm not part of it, but you know, <laughs> I'm not vibrant. But, not vibrant. Yeah. You got a, they got a dull lacquer on you. But. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm Matt. Oh, yeah, yeah. With an E. A, a, a double T-E. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you, Paul, for coming back. Not, not going to ask me to promote stuff? Oh, that's right. You had a book. You got a book that people I, can I get. I do currently have uh, Made for Each Other, which is My Boyfriend is Monster Part t uh, Number 2, but it is linked only by motif, not not by story. Each each one is a standalone. Um, 
I am going to have a, a new Twisted Journeys out uh, sometime, I think late, late this year or maybe early next, which is a combination of prose and comics where the reader gets to pick their own path through the storyline. Mm. Um, and uh, hopefully very soon we will have the remastered edition of Robin of Sherwood about the daughter of Robin Hood out in a trade paperback from, I don't know the publisher yet. <laughs> okay, but you'll do a Kickstarter. No. No. Oh. Not well, not if I find a publisher. Otherwise, yes. <laughs> okay, so storyville.com, storyville on Twitter is that's where you should be. That's the best place. About that. Yeah. Okay. I'm Paul D Story on Facebook. Facebook. Okay. But, but mostly I actually use Twitter more because I can, you know, spew my inanity in in shorter segments. Right. The the, the temptation is not there to be verbose. Yes. Uh, all right. Or vociferous. Ooh. Yeah, when you get angry. Uh, so, yes, but you'll be back on the show I, I, in the I near future so. to talk yeah. more about your upcoming projects. But, yes, Storyville on, on uh, Twitter is where you should follow today. PC Weenies and Storyville on Twitter are the two accounts you should follow today. Uh, sign up for Twitter just to do that. Follow Wednesday. Yeah, follow Wednesday. There we go. Uh, so thank well. you, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Krishna. I'm going to hit the calendar segment, and while I read the calendar, we're going to uh, we're going to trade up. places. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Where is my? There we go. Yep. So check this out. I got I got a calendar stinger finally. Pretty neat. All right, so it's it. the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> So today, today for Ann Arbor residents, uh, the oh, and Paul, I'm basically kicking you out now. So okay, <laughs> sorry. No problem. I'll see you in a second. So today at the Ann Arbor District Library, at the uh, the I believe it's the Pittsfield branch uh, for Ann Arbor residents, grade six to adult, the summer screen printing workshop. And boy, do I have a, a bombshell to drop about that one. Uh, glow in the dark ink, everybody. You're going to be doing prints, and they will glow in the dark when you are done. That is at from seven to eight thirty p.m. at the Pittsfield branch. Uh, tomorrow in Dearborn at Green Brain Comics. I mentioned this last week, but it's worth repeating. Uh, Green Brain Comics is an assembling an exhibit for the Headspace Gallery in honor of the 50th anniversary of the first issue of the Fantastic Four. And uh, you can sign up to be a part of that. Everybody, they're going to do a page for, uh, from the whole book, uh, each by a different artist. You can sign up to participate at greenbrain.biz slash gallery.htm. It'll be in the show notes. Uh, gallery with a capital G, by the way. Uh, summer reading game is on. And uh, we got Eli Nyberger of the Ann Arbor District Library right next to me to talk more about that. How's it going, Jersey? Good. Going good. I was I was listening to your earlier uh, your earlier discussion, and it, it reminded me of uh, I've just been reading this, uh, which is Peter Bag's Other Lives. And you know, Peter Bag is a uh, uh, he's kind of a journalism jur you know comic journalist kind of guy. Yeah. He's, uh, uh, writes does a lot of comics for uh, Reason Magazine, home of all libertarian comics, I, I guess. Um, but he does some really great stuff. And this, this book came out about a year ago, but one of the things that features in it pretty, pretty prominently is uh, some plagiarism and sort of some stealing of material and ownership and things oh, like cool. that. Oh, cool. It was very interesting. Uh, and there's also a, uh, a sort of a version of Second Life that's in here, only um, it apparently actually has people in it. So there's a uh, a different sort of, uh, you know, it's talking about the interplay between the online world and the offline world, and just really interesting, great Neat. book, short read, black and white graphic novel, Peter Bag, and that is published by Vertigo. So that's, uh, I've just been reading that and was thinking about it as I was listening to you guys talk yeah, earlier. Yeah, yeah, I have not heard of this, so that's cool, and that's in the library collection. This is in the library collection right now, and it's basically, uh, unlike a lot of his other stuff, um, it's not really based on kind of real people you know if you've ever read any of his stuff from hate uh where he had these two big characters buddy and stinky and they went on for years and years you know and you could very easily see kind of people who came from new jersey and went to seattle in those characters these are kind of more uh more generic characters a little bit but they kind of get into some interesting scrapes and it's highly recommended very quick read read it at lunch yesterday so it's uh, oh cool i would highly recommend that other lives by peter bag and um you know, and it was making me think as you guys were talking about it because, uh, you know, as, as a library, we kind of, you know, we're in the content business, but we exist outside the commercial world in some cases where we buy this once and, you know, how does Peter Bag feel about the fact that we buy this once and 50 people would read it or yeah, 60 people yeah. or 70 people would read it, which in some ways would be good, but, you know, there's very much perception in the publishing industry right now that uh, every borrow is one less sale. And I think that it's not really a zero-sum game and that they look at it that way. But, you know, uh, it reminds me, of, I also wanted to mention um, 
in the web comics world, uh, there's a comic that I read called Kinoko Fry by Rebecca Clements. I believe she's from Australia. Okay. Uh, it's a really great web comic. She's really talented. She almost lost me for a couple weeks when she had like a um, it's like a three month story arc about trying to find sustainable leggings. But after she got past that, I was like, this is some really great stuff. So. Uh, she has just launched a new webcomic, and it's called Ruffle Hall. It's rufflehall.com, and it's, it's really interesting stuff, got really beautiful look to it, almost like Susian in the way that she does her art. And so that's, mm. that's highly recommended. You guys should check it out because I think that, you know, a lot of what you guys are talking about really fits into the webcomics business model as opposed to the print comics business model. And I think that one of the challenges is going to be monetizing your audience as opposed to selling access. You know, mm -hmm. no webcomic artist is really selling access. They might be selling access to uh, advanced content, you know, behind the scenes bonus stuff. Right. But their stuff itself, you don't pay anything to get their stuff itself, and they have other ways of monetizing their audience and making a living off of it. And I think that that is most likely to be a model, in my opinion, that all media kind of moves to because it's just, you're just not going to be able to get people to pay for bits moving forward, I think. Not even if you're like really tiny niche. I think it's, well, if you're really tiny niche, you know, you're going to have so much motivation to try to grow your niche, you know, and it's like, it's a thousand true fans thing. Yeah. You know, how do you get, if you can get a thousand true fans, you can make a living. Uh, are you familiar with, they might be giants recently had a thousand true fans program mm. where they, for the first thousand people that signed up for their, I forget what they call it, super fan program or something like that. They got their new album on, on CD. They got a digital version. They got a vinyl version. And they got two tickets to a They Might Be Giants show of their choice to be named later for $90. Oh, my God. And they sold, or maybe it was $80. I think it was $80. They sold the thousand memberships that they wanted to sell in the first couple days. Wow. And, you know, that was an 80 grand payout for them. That was a very smart business move. And yet it wasn't about selling access to the content. It was about selling an experience. And mm -hmm. I think that it's a really, it's going to be really tough in this decade and the next one, I think, to monetize access to information, you know, because Paul, it's just, it's going to be everywhere. Paul F. Tompkins did something similar. Where he did this on Facebook. I don't know if he's still doing it, but he did like uh, the 300 in your town. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have like if 300 people in a town said they'll attend the show, then he would book the show there because then he'd at least be guaranteed the 300 seats. Right. right? So yeah. Yeah. About getting your audience uh, to, like you said, monetizing on it. So I, okay. Well, that, I think that's a, that's a pretty awesome perspective to throw <laughs> on at the end, Eli. Well, so and it's a good you. thing for libraries too, yeah. because I mean, in many cases, if you got a library, you might not need you might not need three hundred people to make it worth your while. You know, we've brought people into Ann Arbor for our audiences, and we've paid their way. We've paid for the airfare, we pay for their time, we give them an honorarium, those kinds of things, mm -hmm. and that makes those trips make economic sense. I know back in uh, two thousand eight, we were the anchor leg of Chris Onstad of Akewoods. Midwestern tour. He right. wouldn't have even come to the Midwest if we hadn't been in a position to say, well, we'll get you out here. We'll mm -hmm. have a program. And then it's on your own to go wherever else you're interested in going. Right. So I think that you know libraries continue to play a role not just in content access, but in access to experiences. And I think that that's going to increasingly be the way that creators of all types monetize their work moving forward is through selling experiences and buying into a club as opposed to here are these bits and if you pay you get to have them but then what about uh so does that mean that you just can't monetize casual experience anymore because okay like, like I'm, I'm saying by comparison i go to the bookstore there's a copy of newsweek i flip through it and i'm like well this issue looks good i'll get it but i'm not getting a subscription i don't care that much about the magazine right, right. what about those people i mean have you pretty much just written them out of the equation are we now in a a, a truly digital world of on and off you're well, either I a think, super fan or not well i think the catch is is that uh you know the more people who pick it up the more super fans you're going to have Mm -hmm. And that there's increasing, well, it's, you know, it's like the ebook authors who are now finding that they're selling more copies of ebooks that have a free version than the ones that don't. Because the more people you can get it in front of, the more super fans you make. Right. And it's not, looking at, it's not looking at making money one person at a time. It's looking at it as how many people can I get my work in front of? Because I know that a certain percentage of them are going to become super fans. So therefore, the more people you can get your work in front of, and that doesn't go through paying per use, mm -hmm. you know, the more super fans you're going to have. I mean, I think we will see in the next, in, in this decade, the tens or whatever we're <laughs> going to call the teens. Are these the teens? I guess um, so, yeah. I think that we're going to see a, a 
best-selling novel author release a book with no fee to access it. And it'll be either ad subsidized or bought, I mean, you know that some of these big authors can make a lot more money selling Google ads on every page of their book mm -hmm. than they're making in the royalty from their publisher. So I think really, you guys, the self-published guys, are out in front of this change that's gonna be happening, you know, and that you are already ahead as because you see this problem a lot with, uh, with creators who have already gotten hooked on the royalty advance model. You know yeah. what I mean? Because the whole publishing business is about making back the advance, you know, in print, uh, or especially in, in uh, you know, long form text. Mm -hmm. And that's, just, that's speculation. It's not gonna be able to work that way forever. So I think that the idea of, I'm gonna produce this thing and get it out there and see how many fans I can net from it is gonna be probably the dominant way that creators make money going forward. Because I think it's gonna be, you know, it, and in this book, in Other Lives, there's one thing that, um, where there's a guy who's afraid that he's a plagiarist, but someone else basically runs an analysis on everything he's ever written and says, you're not as much of a plagiarist as you think you are. Yeah. Because there's, you know, you can basically compare it to the entire corpus of written text and see what is out there that's been copy and pasted before. And I think that like what Krishna was saying, where, you know, the internet has a pretty, cons well, you look at that big blow up on Etsy a couple weeks ago about uh, there was somebody who had been making on Etsy little pendants with of shape of a state with a heart cut through it. And then next thing you know, Urban Outfitters is making this exact same product okay. with a very similar name. And you know, the whole Twitter sphere, you know, Etsy, very similar to the comic people. Um, Etsy is very, uh, uh, they t come down on one side of intellectual property laws and it's not exactly where the law is. You know, it's mm -hmm. what they wish the law was, you know. Yeah. But the, uh, it turned out that of course, people were finding five and six different previous artists who had done the same idea and were selling it on Etsy before the one that everyone was rallying around. Oh, wow. You know, and it's like, there's certain ideas where it's like, you know, you can't steal culture. You know, it's just, it's, it's just an idea that someone had. Now in comics, with you got a specific artist, uh, right, a specific right. character, right. it's a very different kind of thing. But you can steal images. You can't steal fans as easily. You know what right. I mean? It's because once someone gets into it, they tend to find out, hey, you know, this guy is a pale ripoff of Jeff Smith or, or whatever. Right. And I think that in monetizing fan bases, comic artists will have an opportunity to kind of uh, uh, theft proof their revenue streams because, you know, it's, it's not easy to steal someone's fans. You have to actually be better to steal someone's fans. You can't just steal their images and take the fans with it. But I'm, 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 I'm seeing the, the cartoonist who's listening to this going, oh my gosh, you mean I have to get out in front of people and I have to make my personality and my presence mean as much as the content itself. Uh, that's what it sounds like to well, the person who's, you know, who, if you're monetizing your fans, if you're selling an experience, then you, the creator, have to be a little bit more personally involved than the person who's like, look, I just wanna make some comics and get paid for it, dude. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's uh, that's a challenging thing. I don't think that the experience has to necessarily involve the creator as a person. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that it's a matter of, of being involved with the community. Well, I mean, and even, you know, the, of course, the best success story in this Penny Arcade, the guys themselves are kind of a big factor in that, but yeah. they're really different from their characters. Right. You know, and it's kind of like there's these, you know, it's there's the online and the offline world. And I don't think that make that monetizing experiences for your fans has to necessarily be the same thing as putting yourself out there as a person. It's just a matter of saying, what is the value that my fans receive from being a fan? You mm -hmm. know, and how do they choose to support me or what objects do they can they purchase? Or, you know, I mean or even like Cory Doctorow and his uh two hundred fifty dollar hand stitched leather bound things. He said that he made more money from that run of 250 hand-stitched leather-bound copies of his book than he has from ever, any advance from any publisher ever. Right. You know, so it's like, that's about how you, I mean, and that's not about him, that's about him making a product that's appealing to his super fans. Right. And a way to monetize on a completely different level. And I forgot about the whole Nine Inch Nails thing, what Trent Reznor did, where he actually released the music as GarageBand files that people could mess with, and yeah. he was inviting them. It's like, remix it, post it online, right? Yeah. Uh, and, th and, and then he did like the $700 box set kind of dealy do, which for the super fans, and he made an ungodly amount of money right. uh, off of that. So, yeah, the, 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 there's been already some success stories in this realm. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of trying to do 21st century business in a 21st century business model and not trying to make 20th century business models fit the internet.
You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, how can we bring the Pony Express back? You know, it's just, there's some things that aren't going to make economic sense anymore yeah. in the presence of essentially free bits for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> free bits for I hope, I hope I'm not too far too far afield <laughs> from the uh, no no the this was great I'm glad I'm glad that you brought in <laughs> you brought in some more to think about on top of all this so we didn't just stop dead because I had to do the calendar thing so no thank you for that Eli and so other lives by Peter Bagel yep. will be in the show notes as well a uh, few last announcements uh, next week starting next week if you're interested in this comics jazz if you think this stuff this this talk was interesting you can participate in the comics class uh, there's two of them going on one on Tuesdays one on Wednesdays the one on Tuesdays is for kids that's uh, the comic book academy at Mallets Creek from 1 to 3 p.m. you can sign up at aadl.org well actually you don't need to sign up there's no registration required just show up but you can find out more information there and then on Wednesdays if you're a grown-up and you want to learn more about making comics and being a, pub a self publisher you can come to the uh, Pittsfield branch on Wednesdays from 6 to 8 p.m. to take the comics fundamentals course. And there's going to be a whole bunch of follow-up courses in between. There's going to be Create and Draw Cartoony Characters with Denver Brubaker, uh, Create and Draw Anthropomorphic Animal Characters with Janie Ho, and then, oh, I also have this on there for July 15th. The Story Collider's coming back. That's eh? right. Yep. Yeah. You, did you want to talk about that? Yeah, one? sure. Uh, so Story Collider is something that uh, started in Brooklyn, as many things do. <laughs> and it is basically, uh, they their elevator pitch is the moth meets, the, the moth meets Nova. You know, so <laughs> moth is like the, you know, sort of online yeah. or, or the, uh, the storytelling resurgence stuff. Uh, so basically, they want people to tell personal stories about science that are entertaining. And uh, the last time we did this, uh, it's headed up by Brian Wecht, who's a uh, particle physicist, and uh, his friend uh, Ben Lilly, who's a, a formal, former physicist and now does storytelling full time. And so the two of them make great hosts for this event. And uh, uh, so Brian will be putting together a program of a couple different local storytellers telling personal, entertaining stories about science. It was a really great event last time. So that's coming up on July 15th at the downtown. July 17th, Friday, July 17th at the Downtown Library. Oh, why did or I say 15th? That's I think weird. that might have been an old poster. Whatever that Friday is in July, that's the one. <laughs> uh, that's uh, the Story Collider event. And that's just a, it's just a super cool event. Very entertaining, very talented storytellers, and great for any sort of stripe of geek who wants to hear personal stories about how science has touched people's lives. So that's a great one. And you can find out more about them at the Story Collider. They're online on Twitter and all over the place. Yeah, at storycollider.org. And so there's there's an experience that you That's can right. get from the library, right? Uh, okay, cool. Well, thank you, guys. This was an awesome episode. This went nowhere where I thought it was going to go, but I'm glad it went where it did. I thought I was going to talk about writing romance stories and writing personal uh, stories, but uh, we'll save that for another time. So, Okay, so Eli Nyberger of... Uh, ADL.org. Do you want to throw out your Twitter handle? Yeah, I'm, I'm Ulotricus on Twitter, which means curly hair. U L O T R I C H O U S. <laughs> and then uh, everybody should check out play.aadl.org yep, for, for the summer game. Summer game. Yep. And then the, uh, the screen printing workshop tonight at Pittsfield. So, okay, well, thank you everybody for l listening and downloading and watching. And until next time, I've been Jersey Droz of uh, comicsagreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. And okay, bye. <laughs>